So today we had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Stephen Baker. And this conversation went pretty deep. We went through uh, the details of what a medical device manufacturer goes through. We went through wireless technology and a bunch of the depths behind it and wireless security and the interplay of that and how that affects hospital deployments and decisions that need to be made. We go into a lot of depth that I know some of you, we may, uh, we may lose your interest, but I hope that you can appreciate the depth and detail that goes into this uh, in the complexity that's involved. And our, the bottom line is, you know, abstract yourself from, from the details, try to understand and see those themes that, are, that we highlight. And I try to reemphasize that Steve has talked around the challenges they go through and the decisions that you need to be making and a role that you could be playing that's a little bit different perhaps than you're playing today. So hopefully this was insightful and thank you for tuning in. Well, welcome. I would like to introduce Dr. Steve Baker, uh, a, uh, a friend of mine and a colleague from, um, from many circles in the industry. And before I introduce him, I'd like to give you an idea of what the purpose of, of why are we interviewing the rocket scientist, uh, Dr. Baker, here <laughs> today. <laughs> what I feel is missing oftentimes in healthcare IT, uh, frankly, in every industry. But in healthcare IT, there's a lot of complexity. Uh, and in healthcare as a whole, we have workflow, we've got uh, you know, all these different roles and, um, and aspects of, of, of how the healthcare, the business of healthcare is conducted. And when you only have walked in your own shoes, you don't have the perspective what it's like being, let's say, in a medical device manufacturer, which we're going to dive into uh, hard today. But infrastructure manufacturers, to being a clinician, to being a reseller, integrator, partner, so there's a lot of different roles. And I am hoping that, Steve, you can share for, <clears throat> for the viewers today uh, your perspective and what that means in context. So I'm going to ask everything of everybody watching today. I really want you to push yourself to, to see it through the lens of a medical device manufacturer and what it's like to develop you know, some of this technology. That fair, Steve? Sounds good. Very good. So Thanks, let me introduce Sean. you. Uh, you graduated with honors from Utah State University and then completed a PhD in electrical engineering at Cornell uh, with a focus on space sensors and telemetry systems. Uh, you're a a senior member of IEEE and a fellow for AMI, the Association of Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, of which I got, I first got to know you. <clears throat> um, so after your tenure as a rocket scientist, literally, right? So that's kind of always fun, right? To make uh, jokes about that because rocket hearing is a uh, is like an, an, in a new era uh, nowadays, in which I bet uh, maybe at the end we can just. Talk about that a little bit, just think, you know what that means. So hang, so everybody needs to hang tight. <clears throat> so at at Amy, um, you and I are part of the Wireless Strategy Task Force, uh, and we, we can talk about that a little bit today. And now with HTA, the Healthcare Technology Alliance, and we're both on the steering committee. Uh, there was a number of areas around what you did coming out of uh, Cornell with physiological sensors and medical telemetry, where you pioneered some use of uh, standards-based communication for medical telemetry, uh, high acuity stuff in healthcare, um, meaning it better be reliable, it better be delivered. You know, the, you're dealing with the sickest of all patients. Mm -hmm. And including all of these security aspects of it. Uh, you, you and I tend to intersect around, um, and, and I would say share a, a passion around make wireless reliable and a darn well better be secure. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yes. Um, but then they also added and make it cheap. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then there's the, the general rule of cheap, fast, or good, pick two. 
right? <laughs> Cheap pass so, secure. You can play that around a little bit, right? So the thing is, security is this thing that we talk about a lot. It's incredibly important, but yet it seems to always be given short shrift. When I talk to IT security managers, they are told at hospitals, here's some new medical thing, make it work. Well, it's not secure. That's not my problem, Sean, make it work. Yeah. And so even though we talk about it a lot and we see headlines, um, a particular hospital chain in California a year ago got hit pretty hard with a ransomware yeah. attack. And, and, and there's more that don't necessarily hit the headlines either that people need to right. Um, and the, the funny thing is, I was talking to the IT security manager before and after that, and his answer about how much the administration listens to his inputs and requests for support went from zero to very full. Like, yeah, <laughs> and you take right. advantage of those moments, right? Never, never right. let a good crisis so, so go why? On. With all of the cybersecurity stuff that's out there, why do we continue to sit and rest on, well, we hope it, it's going to be secure instead of actually investing in making it secure. And so that, that's where uh, I've changed a lot of my focus from making the data reliable in the sense that the physical layer can do the job. Yeah. Um, recently had, um, the uh, equivalent of the FCC from uh, Japan, one, one of their uh, 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 consultants called and asked, and, and they're like, how do we make, their whole focus was on how do we make the physical layer work? And the response I had to give is, it's not the physical layer anymore. That we needed to worry about 20 years ago. 802.11 is a robust communication protocol. So let me play this back. And, and I think that uh, there's a theme here that, um, that's repeating many times over. So in your view, you, the, the communication link has, the reliability has been solved. Would you say that that, uh, one, is a fair statement, and two, that that is not by exception or that's unilateral? Um, I say the technology exists for any hospital to have a reliable 802.11. Good, I was pinning network. you down around that. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that every hospital has implemented it in a good way. If um, there are a lot of improvements in the standards that came out um, that not every client device supports, but all the tools are there. And we're gonna talk about some of those today. Uh, then the next follow on to that is, so when you achieve reliability, is it fair to say that the next step is making it more secure, hardening it, if you will? Um, okay, 15 years ago, yes. 10 years ago, yes. Now, I, I'd say security and reliability need to come hand in hand because we have so much opportunity for uh, bad players to screw up your reliability by um, getting in and making, breaking the security. So, but yes, if you, have a, if you have a reliable system with no bad guys, yes, you need to make sure that you are working on the reliability. And that's one of my frustrations. You, you go and look at um, known vulnerabilities and mitigations and the mitigation is almost always, uh, go put this infusion pump or this uh, ventilator behind a firewall. In my mind, that should be the last layer of defense. Yes, we need to be able to do that, but let's make the medical devices secure in their own right. Very good. So let's give us, I want to flip this around a little bit. I want to make sure people don't interpret what we're saying as a, as a finger wag. Like you need to be doing this differently. You need to be doing this something. They, you know, all of these other things. And I think what Steve was just talking about there is a the theme that I want to kind of pivot back to. One is I want to give, I want to give exposure to what, what the challenges that you deal with when, you, when management comes to you when you were with, with Welsh Allen and, and you said, hey, here's this medical widget. We've been making it successfully and we're market dominant in this area for this medical widget. Go ahead and make it. Yeah, I need you to go ahead and make it wireless. And I'd like you to go through, you know, some of the background around that. And then I want to talk about how 
the security context of what uh, I, the lead in of asking you, once it's secure, then you solve wireless. And you said, mm, it should be together, which I want to follow on that theme um, secondary. So that's spot on. So first, when making a wireless device, what is something that every customer purchaser uh, should know but doesn't? There are always bugs. And what does that mean? Like, uh, in, in the, you are producing bugs? Well, okay, let me uh, give you a tangent. So I was in a, working with an IT guy and uh, I was talking about changing his IT vendor. And he said, well, I won't buy from that vendor because they have a list of published known bugs. And I looked in his knock. <laughs> <laughs> when it, every device in here has a list of known bugs, just because you don't know what they are, doesn't mean they aren't there. Everything is released with bugs. We review them, make sure they are reasonable. That is unlikely to cause patient harm or harm to the company. And let me back up for context. So that is, you've, you've engineered let's just say wireless and the insecurity elements into the device. And in your QA process, you, there's a list of bugs that come out and you're talking about that, that event of when you review. Okay. Right, so, so we review those and um, go through a risk analysis process. How, okay. how bad is that? Risk bugs? analysis process. So, so, some, of those are, some of those are just annoyance bugs. Yeah. Like it takes too long to connect. It takes 10 seconds to connect and we want it to be two seconds. Okay, that's an annoyance. <clears throat> um, a bug that we found was in an early radio, on roaming from the first access point to the second, we lost our data connection for six seconds every time. And on a real-time telemetry system, that was not acceptable. So in that case, it Agreed. was not released. Yeah, bugs are contextual to the, to the use case and the functions of what is being right. done. I, I totally agree with that. Tell me about you buy a wireless radio from a manufacturer. Those are completely free of bugs, correct? Uh, well, first of all, I think it's funny that you call it a wireless radio because I have never seen a wired radio. I call that an Ethernet cable, but. Um, uh, well, it's uh, redundantly redundant. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. But, um, it's like no. very, very unique. Yes. Wait, when is unique not unique? <laughs> so just as the, uh, you asked me, what should a, in the hospital know about our device? Well, it's released with bugs. The, the radio has bugs in it. The uh, main CPU has bugs in it. The SPO2 has bugs in it. The ECG has bugs in it. Um, Wait, you're telling me you buy a radio from a manufacturer? and it has bugs in it yes what do you do about this so for example um a security vulnerability comes out like hey the bluetooth protocol is broken fyi every chipset's affected you might want to go secure that and like okay. these messages come out from time to time whether it be wi-fi or bluetooth it doesn't, okay so doesn't so there's there two different classify two different bug types they're known uh Paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, there are uh, known bugs and there are unknown bugs. Um, it's the unknown bugs that we really need to worry about. Yes. So the known bugs we have discovered, we know that fast roaming doesn't work. Okay. From the um, chipset manufacturer. So you, what can you do at that point when the chipset is, when that part, that function of the chipset doesn't work? So as an example, when our fast roaming wasn't work, was slow, one of the things that was happening, 802.11 is a break before main connection. So it leaves the first access point and the system says, oh, no network connection. And it tears down the entire network stack. So in that case, we just didn't tell the network stack that we lost the network connection. And that saved having to do a new DHCP request and a whole bunch of stuff. And mm -hmm. That changed our our loss from six seconds to one second. Well, if you're delayed by one second to get a um, no heartbeat alarm, that's okay. Six seconds and higher, yeah. Six seconds is pushing it. 
10 seconds is our requirement. We have to, from the onset and alarm condition, we have to enunciate the alarm within 10 seconds. So if we use six seconds, that's really pushing against the limit. So um, what we have to do is we either work with a manufacturer to mitigate the bug, which could be they give us a patch or they actually give us a solution. Okay. We work with something or we don't release it. Hmm. So now, I've, I've experienced some cases where the, the chipsets that you're incorporating into your devices, and let's say they've been shipping for two, two years and there's a bug that's discovered, the unknown bug, you know, that surface or a new security vulnerability comes out. And some types of chips aren't, call it upgradable or flash upgradable. You can't just change the driver. Right. Uh, is it fair to say those, those scenarios you were talking about where there's a patch or it, it, those are flashable chips? Right. So the ones where it's not upgradable, this is where the manufacturer says, just put it behind a firewall at the hospital. Yeah, because by the way, we have no other choice. Right. Um, now, flipping it around as uh, a quote from Kevin Fu, who's the, I'm trying to remember his title exactly, anyway, he's the acting director of medical device security at FDA CDRH. That's pretty close to what his title is. Um, yeah, very good guy. Uh, but if you take all of the FDA guidance about cybersecurity can be summed up like this. Medical device should be secure on the day of release and secure secureable every day thereafter. Let me play that back. Secure on the day of the release, that makes a lot of sense. But this thing around, you know, deploy it and forget it, uh, that those days are gone. Like it has to be, we have to be able to keep securing this, you know, day 317. Yes. So Maybe five years ago, things slipped through without that, but Kevin is really working hard to make sure that his auditors are checking this stuff. And I asked him, I said, look, I've, I've seen some stuff, like Wi-Fi radios that are out there in the wild that still have the crack vulnerability, yeah. um, key replay attack, um, and they have a FDA 510K clearance. And he said, those days are past. So uh, to paraphrase Pirates of the Caribbean, device manufacturers, you be warned. Um, so this idea of, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hospital IT guy, you need to put it behind a firewall. Those days should be past. It should be that the medical device manufacturer yeah. has a solution. now. Flip side, medical device manufacturers are going to say, this device is supported for seven years or 10 years. If the hospital wants to keep using it after its end of usable life, don't expect a medical device manufacturer to keep upgrading your CT that is running on Windows XP 15 years later. Yes. So I, I would see, I, I, would, I would agree with you that I'm seeing a, general shortening of life cycle uh, because of all this IT complexity. It may, the device may still absolutely perform in its medical function, but because we have the split brain, you know, capability now where all the functions aren't just within the device and it either beeps or it doesn't when it detects it, they're connected into, you know, over networks into data aggregation platforms where analytics and reporting could be done off of it. So with the, the function of the medical device isn't standalone anymore. I mean, it's basically split brain. Well, it's a system of systems, but also even within a medical device. So uh, let me talk about software bill of materials, which is one of the things that Kevin and the FDA have really asked for. So here's a question that's supply chain related. This is an area that I don't you you might feel it's assumed by your customers i am here to tell you that in my experience it is absolutely not and in fact shocking for many people to hear you have a device that's been shipping for let's two three years and another customer order comes in they need they were going to buy ten thousand of these so you you don't have these things just sitting in a warehouse right you're manufacturing you know, on demand. Manufacturing. Yeah. So you have all of these, let's say, 
300 plus components that might be embedded into your, your solution in supply chain, you know, related, you have a chip in there that you go to order it. Yeah. We don't do that one anymore. Right. So you have, and, and you look at the box, like this is the same make and model as this one, but yet somewhere inside, like there's stuff that's changed inside and, and how would that manifest to what, how customers need to understand how to, how to deal with these over their life cycle and, and testing and engineering. So for one is how common is that occurrence? So um, with small components, it's rare. So resistors, capacitors, sure. there may be some, like you have a very specific inductor uh, that is custom built. Those are the simple function components. Like it either, you know, a resistor right. capacitor, they have very, you, there's a lot right. of so, options. To, to and, and yeah, it's very easy to change those out. Exactly. Then we have things like microprocessors. So um, a manufacturer might end of life their microprocessor. Now on something like this, there are two supply chain issues. One is an end of life. Well, they're going to tell us a year in advance. We can do a last time buy. We can support customers for two or three years without very much trouble. Then the other is this some kind of supply chain issue we have right now. Suddenly, there's the toilet paper problem. Oh no, everybody needs whatever microcontrollers. And so somebody goes out and buys a million of them, even though they only need 100,000, they buy a million because they don't want to worry about it for the next year. Well, that makes me, who only needs 10,000 of them, unable to buy any at all. Yeah. So in that case, um, now the thing, now the next question is, does this function affect an essential design output? That is, is it essential for safety and efficacy of the product? It's a microprocessor, it probably is. So then the FDA gives medical device manufacturers some rules on basically how much validation and verification testing we need to do to make sure that the replacement is valid. And then on the third, but a lot of times we can find a sister processor that does the same functionality. Um, what's important for us is it has the same pinout, so it's easy. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you don't want to have to go reprint all your PCBs. So I don't have to do a new board. circuit board. Now, when you get to a module, like let's say my SPO2 module or my radio module is unavailable. This, because now if I change to a different radio, I have a new FCC equipment authorization that I have to get obtained and um, changing design for different, possibly for a different antenna. So as the complexity of the part goes up, the complexity of replacing goes up. And the bottom line is the medical device manufacturer tries to do purchasing so that hospitals never see that. So do you communicate that to customers? Well, if some of it's kind of the way um, your telephone hold time weight is. Due to unexpected call volumes, due to COVID, come on, we've had it for two years. Yep. <laughs> um, so in the beginning, it's, it's just a delay and it just gets shipped a couple weeks late. Yeah, and, I, and I'm gonna give some examples and it, and it goes beyond medical devices, of course. It goes into network components and um, consumer electronic devices, which is what we deal with on the daily, right? And we're bringing those into work now. So it's been more than just what the, what the hospitals buy. We, um, <clears throat> and, I, and I don't wanna pick on the vendor at all, but you know, we had a, um, a voiceover Wi-Fi phone that was heavily deployed all over production. We had uh, a lot of engineering that went into making sure that thing was tested against whatever code we were doing here. And we knew all, is, as many of the known knowable nodes, uh, knowable bugs, right? Uh, right. And we're all the workarounds. Well, lo and behold, uh, a new order gets placed and we get a new device. We're like, huh, like we can't even put the, the software, our, our golden software image, um, you know, uh, we can't put it on here. Right. And so we call the manufacturer and say, Wait, this is like we went through a lot of work to do this testing and engineering. We know the word, you know, we have a config, standardized config. It's not loading on these. In fact, these ones are coming with a rev higher, and like 
they're like, yeah. Um, uh, le- well, first it's like, let me look into it. Oh, interesting. Like they didn't know. So they go dig into, into the, uh, the business unit and, you know, talk, talk to the people. Oh yeah. Yeah. We had a chipset shortage. Um, the screen manufacturer, we couldn't get that anymore. So we had to swap it out and that had an impact and had a downstream impact. And so, yeah, you're going to have to go ahead and upgrade on firmware. Right. Not a, necessarily a, you know, a huge issue, but it, um, these are things that you don't necessarily know. So, so it meant right. that, you know, we basically so, had to go through all the due diligence of testing and securing, right? Cause. Right. It's now a different CPU, different code base. My goodness. Yeah. It's basically that you can't tell by looking at it. There was no indicator on the sticker that these were different devices, but inside uh, they certainly were, which is, you know, we talked about earlier of, <clears throat> The, the need to not just focus on reliability, uh, but to engineer with security from the beginning, because you can do all of this engineering. I'd like to get your thoughts on this, but, and how I look at this is you can engineer for reliability that say, oh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and change this, the underlying security mechanisms for how this thing <laughs> operates on the network. No, 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 you gotta, ha- you have to do that in unison t- uh, together. So you're engineering it with one specific intent. Would you yeah. agree or disagree with that? Um, we are. And so within a medical device, have we changed the intended use? So I can put in anybody's Wi-Fi module and I have not changed the intended use of the medical device. Now I say anybody's, that's with some quotes, that's assuming it's one that actually works. Yes. Right. So if my intended use is real time, Uh, patient monitoring and I put in a USB dongle that kind of sometimes works, I would argue I've changed the intended use because it's now not suitable for real-time monitoring. I mean, Steve, this is just wireless. I mean, come on, it always works. Yeah. Um, How many times have you heard that? uh, uh, So many times I... (laughs) So yeah, I, I, I kind of sometimes want to respond. Look, if you want wireless to be really reliable, use ethernet cables. I, the other one is, you know, it, no, we, we do a lot of wireless deployments and uh, they, they say, gosh, why do you have like switch engineers for people to deal with all the switching and everything? Well, it takes a lot of cable, a lot of wire to deploy wireless and all the switching fabric behind it, right? People go, oh, you know what? You're right, right? <laughs> it's kind right. of funny. Even, even cellular? Oh yeah. Right, What's so. Backhaul, like how do you think the backhaul happens between these things, magic? Right, so I talked to you and um, we're on two different cell stations. So we're either going by cable or by satellite. And given our latency, probably not by satellite. Or lack of latency. Lack of latency. So um, let's see. So the, th- the thing is, I can change out an SPO2 module. In fact, I have a patient monitor has three different SPO2 modules from three different manufacturers. They all have the exact same intended use, mm-hmm. right? So when it the the five ten K um, clearance from the FDA is based on intended use. So if my intended use doesn't change, I can change any part on the inside and I don't have to redo my 510K. And that includes radio and system security software. Now, I want to replay this back to the audience, because I'll give you an example of what we typically hear on the hospital side from manufacturers as a, frankly, an excuse I guess? to do in real work. Go ahead. FDA won't let us do that. Yes. Yeah. FDA, no, 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 we can't do the thing you asked because we have 510K approval, we'd have to go put it all through. And wait, you just said, if you're not changing the intended use of this device, and if I swapped out a core component, like hardware component, forget about a software driver and fixing a bug, right? But you swap that out, you don't have to put it through 510K again? Correct. So there, there are a couple of things. So 
yeah, the 510K is based on the intended use. And the FDA has actually specifically come out and called out manufacturers and said, you can make security updates without a new 510K. Uh, I put it in my cybersecurity column six months ago for those in Amy News. Uh, <clears throat> now, when we make any change to the medical device, we are required to do a risk analysis. How much risk is there? Okay, I changed out a this resistor for that resistor. There is no risk to the patient. There's no risk to the manufacturing process. I don't need to change any of my testing protocol. All right. Now, um, I changed my radio driver to um, mitigate a bug, a security vulnerability. Well, you change the radio driver. You should probably do some verification testing, validation testing to make sure that the, the system still meets its intended use. Mm -hmm. So the Basic radio quality still assurance. Works. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't meet the level of a 510K. Usually what it is, is called a letter to file. So you put a letter in the design history file, says this change was made. And there are times where if you get a big enough stack of changes, the FDA will mm -hmm. strongly suggest you do a new 510K. But just like, okay, Let's say I have a this radio, um, and I, I just get a blob from the radio manufacturer, binary large object, and my Linux kernel just grabs that and puts it into the radio. That's it. Okay, so I get the new one that is updated. If it's Bluetooth, it uh, has the Sven tooth vulnerability fixed. If it's Wi-Fi, it has the crack vulnerability or whatever the mm -hmm. vulnerability that is. You put it in, and you turn it on and everything loads and runs, do some roaming tests. Um, you, your risk mitigation shows it doesn't have anything to do with roaming. It doesn't have to do with this or this or this. So you, you test the areas where it may have problems. And after that, you submit your letter to file. Here's our justification. Here's our risk analysis. Here's our testing. That's all it takes. So let, let me dig into that a little bit. <clears throat> and you and I have worked together on several um, several organizations and <clears throat> trying to create guidance for the medical and technology um, <clears throat> industry, you know, through Amy, the Wireless Strategy Task Force, and now through Healthcare Technology Alliance. But there was another event that you and I both attended a um, the Wireless Test Beds Conference. It was held at the FCC headquarters, I think, 2015. Sounds uh, about right co-sponsored with the FDA and like, Hey, you know, how are we going to solve this wireless testing problem? Because there's, there's such an outrage in our, um, everybody was outspoken about how do we solve this reliability thing? But we talked about, and I wanted people to hear this from you uh, on how the 510k, you know, where the FDA, you know, deems you safe to be able to deploy, you know, your medical device or your medical innovation to sell to, you know, to customers for deployment on patients. And the excuses you get, and then the reality. But more important, where is the guy? Where is it going? And so, tell me about you know from the work on you know whether it's IEC eighty thousand one and some of the you know TIR ninety seven and some of these other areas that have to do with um, it, 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 MDS two, right? I mean, anything around. Um, you know, the, the work that, that we've been party to, how do you think that's influenced? Uh, maybe 510K approvals, but overall the common sensibility about how things are being done today. Okay, um, probably the two biggest things are, uh, one I already mentioned, the FDA has a director for medical device cybersecurity. That's that Kevin didn't exist Kirk. before. Didn't exist before, it's only Kevin's that role has existed for only a year, okay? Um, so that, that's one thing. Uh, Kevin is training auditors uh, on cybersecurity and raising the awareness. So that raising awareness also exists in hospitals like that range from the East Coast MGH to on the West Coast to Scripps, for example, or Kaiser, that 
leading hospitals are now requiring you have to provide a software bill of materials or we won't even consider looking at your device. Now that's what's on the surface. Then underneath, and this is my frustration, is the clinical side of the hospital may say, this is very, very important clinically and we need it. So Sean, IT security, you make it work. And my concern is that we are trading this great clinical feature, which is really nice and needed, for weakening of the overall network and supporting all the patients and the hospital business. Um, so that's my concern, but there are numerous hospitals out there and hospital buying groups that have minimum requirements. You can't get anywhere unless you provide at least this. Okay. Um, one of those at least this is, is the MDS2, um, Metal Device Security, survey anyway mds2 we'll yeah. fill it, in. <laughs> um, it doesn't solve every question some hospitals will have their own questions but it it solves a lot of them it does and if a medical device manufacturer is not willing to fill that out and provide it walk away and it and to take it to heart yes. and is it fair to say if uh, a medical device manufacturer because you and I have been on some calls and we, we know we each get our own calls of people making medical devices and they want some consultation, you know, so we share, you know, our experience. And is it fair to say that if you just followed NDS2, would that address, you know, the 80-20 rule? Yes, if, I'd say so. I agree. So if you, if you cover those concepts, and again, that high level concept from Kevin, needs to be secure on the day of release and securable every day thereafter. Every day thereafter yes. So the, the, uh, the radio I have, medical device is actually sitting on my desk. Um, when I first started working, they had no way to upgrade the radio firmware. It was built into the hardware, but not into the software. It had been in the field for five years. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, crack vulnerability. I keep bringing that up because this is why. This is the one I brought up to them. They're like, we What's really that? need to we really need a way to uh, make sure that this vulnerability is addressed before you yes. uh, release more of these products. So the, the overall, the, the large, getting back to your question, the large hospitals that are putting in security policies and actually enforcing them. And the last thing I'd say that a hospital should do, every hospital should do this. Put in your RFQ, your request for quotation, a couple basic security things. Like, will you provide a software bill of materials for your medical device? Or, or you know, take it, take, I agree with you. And they could, the customers can take uh, some snippets out of MDS2. Uh, and also the common sense ones. Do you support 82.1x or whatever the WPA2, WPA3? Right. So WPA3, I'd like to define this real quick. It is a, it's called a wireless protected access. It's the third version. Uh, we've had WPA, WPA2, and of course now WPA3. And it, it really has to do with authentication and encryption when a device joins the network. So understand that it, it really is a, it's a security context. And when we're deploying in the enterprise, it's authentication and encryption mechanisms. And the, the WPA3 is the, third, is the third revision from the Wi-Fi Alliance that specifies what is part of the standard and what is not part of the standard. And what is not part of the standard is oftentimes just as important to, to what is. What do you, we're speaking of WPA, WPA3, mandatory uh, support? Now, um, or does it? Well, I have, a, I have an interesting side story on that one. So, you may know that infusion pump manufacturers have had a little bit of difficulty with security and reliability in the last 10 years. Yeah, there's a little recall and some things like Quite that. A few recalls. Yeah. Um, you know, having root access to their radio without any <laughs> password. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, okay. let's talk about um, what does that mean? A radio versus the was that the device? Does that mean the whole device? To, to break that down for us. Okay, well, we'll we'll catch both of those. So this this actually comes back to the software bill material. So when a hospital gets a software bill materials for a CPU on a device, um, it is rare that, that a medical device, maybe a, a fingertip SpO2 monitor, only has one CPU. But a patient monitor, uh, an infusion pump, these probably have multiple CPUs. And so the hospital should actually be receiving the software bill materials from every CPU on that device because every one could be harboring a vulnerability. All right. So the radio can range from USB dongle. Mm -hmm. This is not. Hopefully this that is, wasn't your Wi-Fi connection. This is a Bluetooth radio, but uh, okay. for my for my mouse, um, so it could be that. But, and some of the scariest, in my opinion, medical devices are the ones that have a USB dongle because fundamentally, my my experience and the experience of IT security guys is that when it's a USB dongle and it's just a plug-in, the medical device manufacturer doesn't really know and understand the radio. That radio does not have a robust driver that allows debugging in the field when there, because there will be a problem. And there is almost guaranteed because that radio has a six to 12 month life. There is no software support for that. When that chipset goes obsolete, the support goes away and there's a new chip. Wait, so you, you, there's a, let's say a, a new vulnerability or maybe some issue affecting the performance of this device that's exposed from an infrastructure upgrade or maybe um, 8 to 11 AX comes out or Wi-Fi 6 um, and it something happened that exposed a bug that, that, that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And that is a medical device that life cycle uh, how long would you say a life cycle is of a medical device? Seven to 10 years. I agree. So five years after you deploy it, still useful life, still trying to get your money's worth. Uh, this vulnerability comes out. You call up the manufacturer of that chipset and what do, what do they tell you? Uh, too bad. There's nothing available. Yeah. Pound so sand just... is maybe another word. <laughs> right. <laughs> so... So that, that's one end. Then the other end is um, even with integrated radios, that doesn't mean. What does that mean? So that, so as opposed to one that's just a USB plug-in, it's actually soldered onto the circuit board. Um, but even, even those, uh, a lot of manufacturers have made them very nice and easy to integrate. This is kind of like, Cars today are very nice and easy to drive compared to a car from, say, the 1960s that was a stick shift and didn't have uh, power steering, didn't have power brakes. Uh, so they're nice and easy to drive. I mean, pretty much a 12 year old can drive a car most of the time. It's, yeah. If they can most. reach the pedals, right? Because you see them drive, you know, my kids had Barbie Jeeps and uh, four wheelers, you know, you right. know the, the battery operated ones. Yeah, it too. Like they're driving. Pretty darn well. I right. never run over so, their siblings time to time. So <laughs> that's kind of where these radios are. They're very easy to integrate, which is a beautiful thing. On the other hand, when trying to test them or um, tweak their performance, um, a performance tweak, for example, a radio that tries to always go to the maximum data rate, which makes a lot of sense from an IT perspective, but not always from a data reliability perspective. <clears throat> and it will tend to have lower range because it's trying really, really hard to run at 100 or 300 megabits per second. Yeah. But if it would slow down to 36 megabits per second, it wouldn't lose the connection. So, um, you know, please let me run the radio. As as an engineer, let me use a radio that I can control to guarantee meets the safety requirements of my medical device. So I can buy a 811B chipset because it's the only one that the manufacturer that allowed me to do that? Uh, yeah, probably not. There, there is a, a company I'm very familiar with that sold 
just this this beautiful device. Um, but it was an A two eleven B WPA pre shared key, and this was after the the WPA vulnerabilities were exposed, and it's like. They you can't, can't put this on the network yeah. and without know who you're talking about. Uh, sacrificing the network reliability, right? So, and then the last radio is one that um, I've chosen for uh, companies I've worked for. And this has things like Secure Boot. It has the, the manufacturer of the radio actually test that radio every week against the National Vulnerability Database. And if there's a new vulnerability, they release a patch, they test it, and they send it out to the manufacturer in a week. So you're the IT guy. Would you, which medical device do you want? The one that has the Wi-Fi dongle or the one that has this other one? But by the way, it's going to cost you an extra $50. And that's a big uh, price jump. For, and when you're doing stuff in the thousands and thousands, that's not your price as a medical device manufacturer. That's customer price, correct? Or That's that... the end. The end product would end up costing okay. the customer fifty dollars more. So two thousand dollar monitor costs two thousand and fifty. Yeah. In the general rule, this is a little segue, but the customers understand impact. So when something's fifty dollar uh, increase, um, you know, because of all of the work that goes into a component change, that component may cost you five cents, but all of the impact of that of that change manifest to that, that that kind of a cost increase yeah okay. well um the man the wholesale cost of radio we're talking at 15 dollars versus 25 dollars yeah and then that yes ends up being about a 50 dollar increase to the customer um but it's short-term versus long-term thinking do you want a radio that somebody is going through every week and checking for known vulnerabilities and will guarantee a, a secure software update if a vulnerability occurs? Now, right now, hospitals are saying, no, it's not worth it. Uh, I would say there's a fair amount, yes. Uh, it, it, because wow, what do they do? Like, like they're they're already inundated with work right. and they don't have feet on the street necessarily in every facility to go update these every week. Right. And the manufacturers haven't always given the ability to just press a button and have it magically, you know, um, happen on these devices. Is all that fair? Yeah. It is kind of interesting that there's actually a, a third party service for uh, checking software bills and materials that has started to, creep up in the industry. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. So the medical device manufacturers aren't doing this and the hospitals are buying them anyway. And then the hospitals are later paying a third party to do the software vulnerability analysis. And I'm saying, no, 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 turn that around. Put that on the medical device manufacturer and pay the cost up front instead of paying it forever afterwards. So, so you said something and it goes back to the beginning and you, you, you recommended uh, in the context of our audience here, largely hospitals and, uh, you know, that are deploying medical devices in the RFP to ask for a software bill of materials. I, there's two, two things you can do. One is what the heck do you do with that information as a customer? Um, but it, I think the point is really about asking the question because it exposes right. it's how they answer it, the question yes. and what they provide tells you who you're yes. dealing with. In the RFQ. All we're doing, this is a rough filter, right? One company comes back at $10 million for an MRI and the other one comes back at 2 million. Well, the 10 million is way, right? You get three offer, th three around 2 million and one at 10 million. The 10 million guy, just, you don't even consider that guy, right? So in radio security, what we're talking about here is not, what do I do with it? To your point, if the, if the medicalized manufacturer will not provide a software bill of materials don't go any further with that manufacturer move on because it's an insight to the level of of um, maturity of the organization exactly okay. their security level is we don't really care about you my customers 
security uh, and our medical device security. Mm -hmm. That's the message is giving. So by asking these questions, just a couple of questions, um, will you fill out an MDS-2? Will you find a software bill of materials? Do you have a path forward to, for WPA3 support? Perfect. Maybe those three questions. And if those answers are no, no, and no, it's a good indication that this is not going to be a good Agreed. security fit with your health care delivery organization. Yeah, because not every organization necessarily has adopted WPA3 or that maybe it's in the plans. There could be things to hold you back. But a lot of times, you know, when we help customers with uh, or, or where I was on the on the customer side uh, doing an RFP, you know, or uh, preparing RFPs to go out. It's I didn't really care to use the information that they had literally, I cared about how they answered it. And are they, do they get why we're asking for it? Because it, there's like a software bill of materials, no, no hospital is gonna know what the heck to do with that. It's not the I point. disagree, a few mm. are. Uh, okay, I'm using the 80-20 rule. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I can probably count them on less than one hand that, that, that would do something with it. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is kind of like, so um, when Van Halen started touring with their huge, huge sets, one of the things they had in their rider was something like five pounds of M&Ms with all the brown M&Ms removed. And people saw this and they gave Van Halen all kinds of grief about how picky and persnickety they were. And later in an interview, I think it was Sammy Hagar said, this had nothing to do with brown M&Ms. This had to do, did they read all read the, the content, detail in yes. the writer? Because if they didn't, then I needed to go and check all the nuts and bolts and all the assembly of the entire stage. Yeah. But if they did, I had a lot more confidence that they did it right. Analogously, if that medical device company answers these with good solid answers like okay let's go on and invest more time in this medical device uh, i want to come back to wpa3 and the, the story that I, I forgot so um wpa3 mandatory so infusion pump manufacturer that i am familiar with the director of r d told me that they have been told by the fda we will only allow you to get a 510k approval if you support WPA3 and only WPA3 on all your devices going forward. That is not true. And do you think that's true? Well, I didn't. I came back and I said, well, if that's what they really said, then they're basically saying you can't sell to any hospital because Thank you. Okay. there are almost no hospitals that have. WPA3 support. Now, a path for WPA3 support is a different thing. Yes, you can't exclude. Um, so, okay, but yeah, please continue. Yeah. So anyway, there's, WPA3 actually does not add an enormous amount for the enterprise. I agree with you. If on a personal level and, and as a consumer, I would argue that was the focus. Yes. Now it does add uh, changes from 100, 28 to 192 bit encryption for enterprise level. Mm. It's not that today we have an issue with 128 bit encryption. Um, and it does change the four way handshake because the crack vulnerability is mostly addressed. Um, WPA3 finishes really making that solid. But yeah, WPA3. It, it's more of chipsets are going to be going to WPA3. Medical devices should be going to WPA3 on their roadmap. It's, it's, and maybe not this year, but in, we have to, is, when, when I'm, if I'm buying a medical device as a 10 year life cycle, I need to look at it and say, what is the security posture going to be in 10 years? Do I want to buy a device that is limited to only this, 
the security system that was released in 2014. Yeah, and let me, let me give a practical example of this, and I think to, to bring this home for people. So when you ask certain questions, what is your path to WPA experience? When somebody tells you, well, okay, this is a fantastic question. Thank you for asking this, because let me tell you what we did with our architecture, because we knew our device was going to be around seven years. So we designed it according to the following things to, to ensure that we had a path. And then versus another vendor might just answer, oh, we do WPA too. Um, or and we it's do secure. WPA. Okay, well, yeah. Or, or when you ask for, oh, another question actually on the RFQ, do you support, support enterprise class authentication? 802.1. Yeah, we said WPA and WPA2, WPA3. Is that the same as, as the WPA? I'll just use WPA2, for example. Is WPA2 the same as, as all forms of WPA2? So I generally break it into enterprise class and consumer class. Perfect. And fundamentally, the difference is the authentication. So in consumer class, it's pre-shared key. So I put a password into my access point, which we call the, the, the wireless okay. router, and I put that same password into my smartphone and into my tablet and into all my wireless devices. And you okay. change it every month. Um, <laughs> Jupiter <laughs> months, every Jupiter month. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So now, you know, now in a hospital, let's say uh, it's a 600 bed hospital. They might have 3000 infusion pumps of which they can actually only find 2000 on any given week. And so if we need to change the password because one of the infusion pumps was lost or stolen. And so now, oh, that actually is an area where one of the other advantages that WPA3 adds is, and again, this is more for home, but some hospitals still use PSK, pretty sure key. Um, what do you mean some? I mean, it is almost, I, again, I, I'll use the same analogy. I can count on less than one hand of hospitals that have adopted, uh, that have excluded it. Let's put it this okay. way. Okay, so key. Does. So jumping back to one of the features that WPA3 adds. In WPA2, you can do offline brute force attacks, which All basically is, it's like getting a copy of the lock, leaving, creating a key for it, and then coming back and unlocking the door to the bank, mm -hmm. okay? WPA3 makes it so you have to physically be at the door of the bank picking the lock. Well, if you're physically at the door, it's a lot easier to be found out, okay? So um, it's called, uh, ooh, oh, shoot, sharing among equals. I don't remember the term. Um, system. Um... Uh, simultaneous. Authentication of equals, SAE. Yeah, simultaneous authentication, SAE. Anyway, so um, the SAE, the simultaneous authentication of equals, authenticate, simultaneous authentication of equals makes offline brute force attacks more difficult so that pre shared key is harder to crack. So going back to the enterprise variety, um, versus the personal variety, right. we employ something called 82.1x. Yes. <clears throat> and it is it requires a stronger level of, and you said it perfectly, it said it really just changes how you authenticate to the network. Right. But consider this for, for everybody that's listening. You know, when you deploy a pre-shared key, you never change it. Right. And that includes when people get hired, fired, whatever, you know, and it's out there. And by the way, some devices, you can extract it from the device. And like you said, it goes out for repair or whatever, but in an enterprise mode, I can deploy a unique credential, a certificate, whether it's a unique username password, it doesn't matter. I can deploy that at every single device. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually making, I'd spend a little bit more time up front um, deploying right. something and there's automated ways of doing this, but I'm, I am saving myself from incredible pain and and security risk of uh, you know profiling do, do you yes. agree or disagree with oh, that, right? absolutely agree um and anyway getting back to the hospital that has the three thousand infusion pumps two thousand of which they can find and a thousand of which they don't know where they are because nurses have hidden them um 
in closets and such. So if I actually need to share the, change that pre-shared key, can do it. I literally have to take thousands of devices offline to be able to do that. So that's yeah, that, that won't disrupt clinical so workflow. It it never to your point never happen. The pre-shared <laughs> key has never changed. Yeah. So given that the pre-shared key has never changed, we should only support 802.1x. Now I understand that's not possible right now because some medical devices don't support it. So put in your RFQ. Thou shalt. All medical support. devices must have support for pre-share for 802.1x. 802.1x, not pre-shared key. Uh, um, well, you could they could they could have it, but make sure that there's mandatory support to qualify to to respond. You must support 802.1x. Is that fair? Right. Now, um, and or we will not buy from your company. Period. Yeah. And put that in RFQs that say, hey, by 2025, this has to happen. And if let's say the 10 largest hospital chains in the United States all got together and agreed on this, I think we'd be making some progress. As an aside, MDS2, which I think is a great document, it's not owned by the industry, it's owned by NEMA, right? So while it may say things like, what security do you have? It doesn't say, if, unless you have, enterprise class authentication, we won't buy your stuff, yeah. right? And that's why I'm saying, put this in the RFQs. Yes. <clears throat> so we talked about WPA3. So what's largely uh, changed with WPA3 versus WPA2? You mentioned the the cipher strength, right? Where the- The, the, the key size the key goes- size. Yeah, the session translates. key changes from 128 to 192 in enterprise mode. Um, and, and you addressed it, 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 it addresses the biggest vulnerability in crack. Is that fair? Right. So it removes the, removes the four-way handshake and that removes the key replay attack vulnerability completely. Um, we mentioned that it provides some protection against the pre-shared key, particularly weak pre-shared key passwords because- Which most are. You can't do the offline dictionary attacks anymore. And um, because you don't each, have a four-way handshake, right? And each client and each access point has its own uh, pre-shared master key. So each, uh, so instead of having one in, in WPA two, you crack one pre-shared key, and you can get to every device on that SSID. Fact. You can yes. decrypt as long as you capture some other information, but you can right. decrypt all traffic from all devices on that SSID, not just device class. Right. It's like an open network where you can pull it out right. of the air. Exactly. So that's another um, improvement to uh, the non-enterprise class, which, as we, as you pointed out, many hospitals still support. Yeah. So. Uh, it's supportive, but I would say I, I think out of every and I. I, I don't think there's an exception. Um, 10 years ago, it was, there were, the list was long in terms of exceptions, but every single one of our current customers deploy 802.1x, and I would say quite heavily. And fortunately, it's the, um, those pre-shared key networks are used for, you know, kind of device silos and usually manufacturers like don't support it, or they just did a horrible job at supporting it. Like where the performance just, Totally yes. tanks, which we see that all the time in doing detailed device testing, for sure. So uh, WEP as a really old wireless security uh, technology that most people, some of you may be chuckling, right? Not hearing on the other end. But let me tell you, Steve's gonna talk about his perspective on WEP and-, and It's available in any way. Yeah. We will not buy your radio. And I think both of those positions are crazy because just because the radio supports WEP, the IT department, can implement 802.1x WPA2 or WPA3. So having WEP available as a configuration doesn't weaken the security of the radio. On the other hand, WEP has been deprecated by 802.11 for I don't know how many years. Yeah. WPA, I think, is deprecated or it soon will be. Um, yeah, so, it's been deprecated, yeah, for WPA. So why are hospitals... I just have to, why is any reasonable IT security T 
team allowing this? And I think the answer is there isn't an IT security team there. That's the only thing I, the only thing that makes sense because why, why would I require that a medical device be put on my hospital IT network that has known vulnerabilities and lets bad guys in and have direct access to my entire network? Yeah. But the point is, right, is that quit, quit asking for unreasonable things. And I think that goes on two opposite ends of the extreme. By asking for web, I, I can promise the thought goes through the, the reader of this request as, do I even want these folks as a customer? Like I can see red flags all over this. The fact you're, you're even asking for this deprecated, really old technology that you shouldn't be deploying anyway, Boy, that's a sign that you're a except train wreck guy, of an environment. Except the guy who's reading it is the sales guy. Which goes to an engineer for the response, though. Fair. <laughs> yeah, oh, fair. Okay. All right. Got to get that. But the other side of it is like the IT, you know, IT guys gone wild um, of being like draconian about the, the, the types of requests. Like you can't even have that in, even in your product, like for, for it to, right. you know, for it to be in. It, you know, that there's a side of that where maybe some customer environments, the central IT procurement, they have poor conformance with divisions of their own organization that kind of each of them run autonomous. So they're afraid to give it. And, and I've, I've heard it. So there's a, you know, I, at least some rationale behind it. Gosh, you know, hey, I, ne I need your help to, to make sure that's not available. <laughs> Right. So maybe it can be interpreted as super firm and, and request, but it, it's, it's, it, it's unreasonable. It, you're compensating for something that you basically need to deal with internally. Right. In so I got way. tired of testing web. And this is after it was replaced with WPA yeah. and WPA2. And so as an engineer, I removed it from the requirements list. And the company I was at, the marketing guy, put it back in. Yep. So then we have to do this extra round of testing. And the reality is, in the next exactly. five years, we sold zero systems with web. Exactly. But I have to do this extra five or six hours of testing with every software release. So, so let's talk about requirements. <clears throat> I have found that IT teams um, have a, um, really a, a blind spot when it comes to really trying to ferret out the core requirements for what it is that. You know, they're being asked to do and understanding the workflow. So a lot of teams don't, you know, they're really busy dealing with all kinds of technology. Uh, and not only do they may not have time, but they may not have the skill set. And I find this certainly to be the case is that it's maybe a small team, don't have the skill set or just don't have the time, but they don't really understand requirements in truly the kind of like a simple, you know, simple list, uh, but they know that they got to buy something or they're being asked to buy something. So they contact you, hey, I need a thing. And that's the norm, it, it, relatively, right? So people are buying things, but they're, so you're making a device. Mm -hmm. you, you have to create an engineering spec because you have a whole team of people that are gonna be coding, putting a hardware design together, uh, <clears throat> all of the features and functions you're engineering a solution for. How often do our customers giving you requirements to, for you to have a solid engineering spec? Well, let me put it another way. How often is a medical device manufacturer asking for those requirements? Oh, this is fantastic. I, I love this. Rarely. So one of the things goes that, both ways. I, Agreed. That, that I had to teach is that, okay, so when I first started at Protocol Systems, there was no Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah. Uh, all medical telemetry in the United States ran. There wasn't even the wireless medical telemetry. Yeah, it was in WMTS. It was all but, wired, right? WMTS didn't even exist yet. Um, we used vacant TV, UHF, and VHF channels. Um, but it was in, I think, 99 that the WMTS was created and 1999 that uh, 80211 first revision came out. So 
at that point, it was a proprietary network. There was not, no cybersecurity. There wasn't a concern at all. Okay. And we didn't even really play on an IT network. Our data analog telemetry went into a switch that was our switch that went to our server. So yes, we were in the IT closet, but we didn't share a single cable with IT. Yeah, it was segmented fully, right? Okay. Now, when I was first asked to deploy Air 211, I was given one general requirement, make it bomb-proof. Bomb-proof. All right. So hard making it bomb-proof, we are the only things on the network. Okay. So we used IT switches, but um, on the wireless network, we were the only things there. Mm -hmm. okay? Then hospitals come along and say, uh, yeah, we don't want two wireless networks. So the next thing was make it work just as well while playing on the same access points as all of IT. Ooh. Now it's getting harder. So that was, but that's a big requirement use the same access points as general hospital IT for sending life critical patient data. Okay, so that's a big high level requirement. Now the kind of requirements I'll get from hospitals are must support 8011 and 8011 AC, must run in the five gigahertz band, fairly high level very high level. And these all come from RFQs that are coming at you and you're seeing right. the differences, kind of finding the commonalities. But it's only when I talk to IT security. So sometimes these come out in RFQs now. Yep. I remember the first time that it came from uh, Intermountain Healthcare. I got an RFQ that said, must have an individually revocable certificate on every device. Yes, I love it. Okay. And I went and I showed that to my vice president and I said, see, we needed it. He says, you probably just like that with those eyes. And he says, we've had that for three years. And this is the first time anybody's asked for it. That means we wasted three years of development time. Okay. So there's your perspective yeah, of know. the business side inside. Okay. Let me give you a similar example. So when I was, uh, I think where I maybe have originally met you when I was working for the, uh, you know, large hospital system and, and I was responsible for the wireless standards and there's, we had a role in all the procurement decisions for around wireless devices. And I found that most manufacturers were developing their products in a vacuum and customers were horrible about sharing what the heck are my needs and and how am i going to be evaluating you when you come to to sell this so uh we put together had my team put together a, a wireless a device wireless device requirements document and i thought this would be you know it would solve some tactical problems it actually helped me with procurement with making sure that you know when by the time it got in their hands they just submitted it to everybody i had even known i we didn't even have any knowledge but they knew but when it went to the vendors, they they're like, ooh, okay, I, I see what you're asking for. And it's supposed to get ahead. Your devices should have this. If it's this type of use case, these are the things we're looking for. If it's doing this, okay, well, there's a couple more things, right? It, I generally got a lot of furled eyebrows of people that were, you know, well, you know, why are you asking for this and, and whatever. And I remember in one of the meetings, there was a, a guy in the back of the room and he was like, he was watching all this. And once everybody left, he said, you know, can I talk to you? And he said, uh, I, we, and this was just a contentious meeting around all of these things. Why in the heck were we asking, being demanding, right? He said, thank you. Nobody has really done this to this level where they've provided us an engineering spec. And what I need to do to take that indoors. So your example, you had to be the one taken a leadership position and some people would call that the people that like cozy jobs that don't like to you know just kind of 
you know, <laughs> yeah. not create any ruffle any feathers. You had to put yourself in the vulnerability category and to say, no, no, no. I'm going to make sure our team has uh, part of our precious R and D cycle. We're going to be proactive because we know this is coming. And you just got hell for three years because you did it. And, the and then finally you got the chance to go to your, go to your CEO and say, see, right. But yeah. that is a shame. You had to do that. Yeah. So, but flipping around one of my favorite quotes, um, Bruce Johnson, IT security guy. Uh, when we showed what we were delivering in 2005, which was a five gigahertz. That's like 10 years old in 2005. Yeah. <laughs> a, a five gigahertz 802.11a, so N didn't mm -hmm. exist yet. 802.1x radio. And Bruce yeah. said, if everybody yeah. built products like you did, my job would be a lot easier. Yes. 17 years ago, and we still have medical devices being built with WEP instead of WPA2 Enterprise. Agreed. Okay, what happens when a customer's requirements conflict with each other? Yeah, you mentioned one, uh, but there could be, do uh, you have any examples of others? Usually the, the conflict is price versus function, right? The customer wants all of this great um, security functionality, but they don't want to pay any more for it. And this is why the medical device manufacturer says, my vice president says to me, why should I pay for all this R&D development time if we aren't going to make more money from it? So that's, that's the problem. That's the bottom line. Security for free. Which really translates to by not making more money with it, what, what it's really saying is that um, there's no customer value to bill somebody for something, right? So there has to be customer value, which then translates to, to more money. So even though right. that comment may sound, you know, where it doesn't sound favorable, but it really translates to customer value. Yeah, there's no, there's no, because RFQs don't say much about security, yeah. it's very hard to justify spending R&D time at the medical device manufacturer to improve the security stance of the equipment when the customer says, I want a bigger display. So if you were king for the day, what, would, what, what should customers, what would you have customers do? Oh boy, if I were king for a day, uh, sorry, I'm going to have you ask that or, or tell them. So if you were king right. for the day, right. what should customers stop doing immediately? Okay. If I were king for a day, poof, you cannot buy insecure medical equipment anymore. <laughs> and, and I'm going to, uh, replay this back to you and have you comment. Cause I think it's, uh, the reasons may be more colorful than, than maybe that, that, that appear when, if somebody is making something that's not secure, it tells you the level of maturity of the organization you're dealing with. And there's a risk profile associated with that, which translates literally to patient risk. There yes. are products on the market that, um, in, you know, we mentioned infusion pumps. So let's use that one as an example that infuse a drug into your veins that the medical device has a process of how much of that to infuse based on what drug it is and your demographic and blah, 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 blah. It, it literally has different infuse rates for different drugs. And if something is hackable, you can literally hack that. I mean, there's other things, physiological monitoring, you can turn it off. Somebody can go into a cardiac arrest, right? There's all kinds of things. So when you're talking about quit buying insecure crap, you know, I'm paraphrasing you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're you're basically getting rid of um, dead wood. Would you agree with that? Yes. And not only that, you're getting rid of dead wood for the next 10 years. Because when you buy that new medical device today, 
you're going to have it for 10 years. So you're, the other thing is, it's reducing the burden on your IT department. All of these devices that have these special rules because they aren't secure are manual upgrades and burdens every time there's an IT change. Manual testing, manual verification, manual oh. notes that are just loaded with burden and rife with human error, right? So eliminate the need for that. We want to use, we have this concept of defense in depth. So medieval castles have this. They're built up on a hill. Great, they have high walls, they have a moat, they have weapons, they have hot oil that they can throw down on people. They have um, uh, uh, crocodiles in the moat, whatever, right? Lots of things to make it difficult for the bad guys to get in. They have an inner wall and an outer wall. Mm -hmm. So even if the first wall is breached, they can go to the inner wall. Well, what we're doing by saying, hey, just put this um, ventilator on a firewall network, you're moving the ventilator to the very inner wall. And once mm -hmm. somebody breaks it, they now have access to the entire castle. Exactly. So buy secure medical equipment, keep the defense as far away from the patient and the hospital network as you can. Then if that fails, then you go to the next layers of defense. Don't depend on the innermost layer of defense for everything. And that's what we're doing right now. Perfect. So with your, what could customers do if they were to, because to make something secure or, or to stop buying something that's not secure is sounds simple, but it's not. So what could customers do to, to define what that means? So the, I think there's, it's vote with your pocketbooks. Sure. Now, we can't just say today, you know, it's kind of like if the federal government says tomorrow there will be no coal powered energy in the United States. Poof. Okay, well, Denmark did that, but they said in 20 years. Yes. Um, so, but there's also power in numbers. So, if, if I could make something happen, it's create an alliance of hospitals that get together and say, here are the table stakes for medical device security. Yes. And they have to be met by whatever, 2025 or 2027, that these things must be met. Now, you know, it's my opinion, fine. If people want to keep supporting WEP, I think it's crazy, but you must meet this minimum security yeah. requirement. It's defined. They've gotten together and they've spoken with, sing with a single voice. So you're not, you're not left after referee between this, which you're, you're not entitled. You're not given that. Right. right. So it's, it's kind of take MDS2 and pull from that maybe the top 10 things yes. that must be done. Provide and, guidance. Yes. Provide guidance. Provide industry guidance from hospitals to medical device manufacturers so that we don't have every medical device manufacturer with their own marketing person saying well i talked to this one person at this one hospital and they said this and the guy from the different medical device manufacturer never talked to it and this one did it's it, not rocket science you know it's interesting you say this it's it's really the foundation what i started clinical ability around was to create a, a to create a single design standard <clears throat> and to and to make that standard uh, supportable over time, i.e. there's updates and revisions. Because when you create a standard, you, you issue that, you get it deployed, and you immediately start working on the next one. But I, what I found uh, you know, through customer advisory boards and industry groups, when I, you, you, meet, you meet all your peers, and you, you pretty much know what everybody's doing and what they're not doing. And you realize if, if I'm asking for a set of requirements to be met, and they're they are they're not, um, or they're in conflict. That's a serious problem, and there is no such thing as a standard, uh, it, even if it's a substandard around the security components. 
There's, there's just not. Right. And there's a lot of ramifications that are, that, that people that you don't necessarily understand are, are fallouts from that. So if you've got, you know, 15 major customers that constitute for a huge part of your test plan when you're QAing a product or coming up with your R&D schedule for your product. You, you know, you're trying to satisfy, you know, the, the bulk of your, your customers, but what does that do to QA when you have all of these? Well, you can't. You, I mean, I can't build, I can't afford to build a separate design device for every customer. Now I can do things like, okay, the web on off. If I have a robust driver, I can actually hide web from the customer who hates it. So they never see it as a configuration mm -hmm. option, but it costs me more time. Mm -hmm. Right. But in, in, in QA, each of these things that you come up with a solution for all need to be. Everything um, has to be tested on every, for every release. release. Uh -huh. It's the gift that keeps giving. Yes. And, and this is, so getting back to the part about when medical device manufacturers say the FDA won't let me. BS. More accurately, the FDA requires that I do testing before I release this. But there's no FDA won't let me. And actually the FDA says uh, you must have a way to provide software updates to address. So in fact, it's the opposite. And we've yes. heard for years and years and years, no, I can't update. I was calling BS on these folks because you know I actually read it uh, and said, wait, there's no part of this that says it can't be in scope right? and categorically false. So if there's one takeaway from this, tell those people to go politely to yes. go pound sand. Right? Okay. So yes, any, you know, we, we're talking about if they don't support uh, or unwilling to support MDS2 and Provide software build materials. If they say the FDA won't let me make my, you know, parentheses, make my medical device secure. Yeah, go pound sand. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a couple minutes left here. I'd like to, uh, that was a great point on the ACOs, creating an alliance and speaking with a common voice that's predicated on the, the, the core set of requirements, MDS2 guidance documents that are out there. What is probably the most important question to ask is, what are you doing for fun? Oh. What's next for you? Well, I am having all kinds of fun consulting. I, I have uh, one group I'm mentoring. They're a, a, it's a startup, and they're a whole bunch of young engineers. And you're a CTO there? Uh, nope. I'm... I'm not that, and the CTO at a different place. Okay, so um, you're busy. I am busy, but I'm entering them in all kinds of applied parts of engineering, bioengineering that are not mentioned in classwork. Like, how do you make a device that has EMC compliance, electromagnetic compatibility? Mm -hmm. How do you design security in from the ground up? Um, another place I'm working that we've, in, Explicitly mentioned as helping established medical device manufacturers improve their security posture. And some of these are just such. You're, you're living this every day, all of these topics. Yeah. And, and what's kind of weird, Steve, is you sound like you're enjoying it. I am. What's wrong with you? It's, it's fun to be helpful. And <laughs> so, but th this is this joy of being a consultant. So I can say the exact same things I told my previous company and now companies go, wow. Yeah. Instead of we wasted three years on that. Hey, I know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're in competition. It's the political atmosphere. And yeah, there's right. all kinds of frustrations around that. The place I'm actually having the right now, probably the most fun is I'm CTO at, as you mentioned at a startup uh, that has a sensor that is helping improve the specificity of sepsis diagnosis. Oh, that's exciting. So right now, big the, problem. The people who get included in a sepsis bundle, 90% false positive rate. So we're helping people survive sepsis by testing everybody. Wow. But the burden of that 
is huge. And so uh, the docs I'm working with have developed a, a sensor that um, it makes measurement on capillary refill time that uh, the Andromeda shock study has shown decreases um, 28 day mortality by eight percentage points. And that's with a human measurement. So we're now automating it. So, so more science every day, more security, focused around delivering clinical uh, device innovation and making people's lives better. Yeah. Dr. Baker, I can't thank you enough for your time today. And uh, we definitely got into the weeds on this one. And I really yeah. hope that people can take away from what you shared. Uh, yes, there's a lot of depth and, you know, I need people to understand that how complicated this is. And I hope you learned something uh, from somebody who uh, I consider a friend and one of the best uh, in the business and that cares about it. You have to care in order to do a good job at it. Uh, and you need to put this into perspective and I think empower how you purchase devices and how you partner with your device manufacturers to achieve a common outcome of reliability and security in, mm -hmm. in your deployments. Absolutely. Well, Sean, it is always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, have a wonderful day. You too, sir.